their program for their stores. Written in the annual report, it mentioned the LMS program. Okay? Boom! There's a shot. You know, I don't know much about public companies. I know a lot about CEOs. When we put it down in writing, usually we're not going to cut it the next year because my investors will come back and say, you were seeing the praises of this and it's no longer here. What's going on? Are you schizophrenic? You know, those kinds of things. So you can see how this kind of strategy can be helpful. Second idea, maybe a little crass, but when things are bad, times are tough, and they're turbulent, get as close to the money as you can, right? Because everybody's looking at it. Whether you're making money by sales and marketing, or you are spending money and want to do less of that in the finance area or the accounting area, the closer you can align yourself with the money, the more you bulletproof your job and your position. Here's a case in point right here. We, learn a, we run a little site for a company called Dell called LearnDell.com. They started about, what, how many years ago? Six years ago, and they just re-upped for another three years, right? So six years ago, we started out, and they had this idea that they wanted to sell training to the uh, end consumer. We went through that, did that, put it all up, and then they changed their business model, right? When Michael Dell came back in and took charge, right? And turned it around to do be a B2B model, business to business model, for small businesses. Guess how much training they sell a year? Including classroom, certification training, and online training off of that site. $400 million. $400 million. Now, here's the kicker. In order to really be significant in Dell, you gotta sell at least what? A billion? You gotta use the B word. Like, 400 million, woo, you know? But they wanted the B word, but here's the kicker to all of this. It's not about how much they sell. Can you imagine the profit margins on a laptop computer? Can you imagine the profit margins on a server when you're out competing in that marketplace? Excuse me, I just got you wet and I am so sorry. <laughs> they're, they're winter boots. So. I, huh? <laughs> they're winter boots. They're winter boots, okay, they've been weatherized. <laughs> I do get excited, you know, so. <laughs> so think about the profit margins on hardware and think about the pro profit margins on digital information. Digital information. And I can tell you, on hardware, single digits, on digital information, high double digits. So it's not about how much you sell, but how much profit goes to the bottom line. That's why they'll do a program like this for 10 years. Boom! the bullet bounces off, okay? Because it's actually making money. Now, we may not be able to you know, resell our training and do all of that, that's kind of the holy grail, right? Wouldn't it be great if we could sell it and make money and do all this other stuff? But sometimes we can't. But you can also get close to the money by doing what Palm did, okay? Palm had released a new operating system, they got a brand new one coming out, and we're working with them on that. But prior to this, if you used the brick and the Palm series system and everything else, very sophisticated software, did lots of things, you know, uh, and they sold these through their stores and then through those little retail, you know, kiosks when you go into a mall and everything else. The problem is their store people knew the product, knew how to sell it, et cetera. But when they went out to their channels to sell, you know, guess what? The return rate was almost double than it was in their own stores, okay? Now, why would that be? It's the same software, it's the same phone, right? The reason they got the returns is because the person selling it to you didn't really know how it operated. Didn't really, wasn't able to train and give you information that would be helpful. The reason they were getting returns is people would get frustrated because they didn't realize how powerful the system was and how to use it. And so this was a classic training issue. I don't know how to use it, I got frustrated with it, it must be the fault of the phone, I'm gonna bring it back, right? So the key here was not to make money, but to reduce returns. And guess what? If you reduce returns of those systems by 1%, you save millions of dollars to the bottom line for Palm. Millions of dollars. Boom! Okay, there's a way to get a bullet to bounce off if you can make some of those things happen. Third idea, leverage, 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 right? What did Archimedes say? Anybody know? Give me a lever long enough, I, I can move the whole world. Absolutely, right? And this is what I'm saying. Today, as professionals in this industry, we have to learn how to leverage everything we can. Because you know what? Are you going to get more staff 
Are they going to say, hey, great, I'm going to add more people to your, you know, to your training department, Amy? Are they going to do that? What are they going to do? Give me more, give me more, right? So you've got to find ways to leverage what you have effectively. And I believe technology is one thing, but you can, le you can, you can leverage the resources of others, you can leverage all kinds of things. But let's just talk about technology. How many people grew up with a set of encyclopedias in their house? Y'all? Okay. I did too. You know, whether it was the Encyclopedia Britannica or Growlers or, you know, whatever the other ones were. We had it. What was the big problem, though? Once you had your encyclopedias on the shelf, there were a couple of big problems with them. What were the problems? Things change. Yeah, the world keeps changing. And then all of a sudden, you've got to get this little update, right? But the problem with the update is, is it in the update or is it in over here, you know? And so it wasn't a really efficient way to update a system. And after many years, it was a very cumbersome way of finding the data and information that you needed. Now, Encyclopedia Britannica, I think, was the first one. When do you think this was first published? Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> it's too early in the morning. I haven't had my coffee, man. <laughs> Time out. We're supposed to, huh? 1930. 1930. No, 1750. Okay, 1750. So this technology was cutting edge technology, right? For many, many years. And then in the 1990s, something came along and almost overnight made it boom, out of business. Out of business. You know what that was? Huh? No, sir. It was that. Remember that? Remember that little thing? What was the advantage of that? Well, one of the advantages is if you wanted to go to school and have your reference library, were you going to take a wheelbarrow with your Encyclopedia Britannica around to do that? No, it was cumbersome. And also, you know, you still had to have those updates and everything else. So portability, you could also add multimedia to this. You could do a lot of things. This was an incredible advancement. It was probably one-tenth the price of what you paid for the Encyclopedia Britannica. So overnight, printing those pages and doing all of that, this replaced it and it was gone, okay? So this was in the 1990s. Now, a couple years ago, something came along and basically, I don't even know if they make Encarta. Anybody got a new copy of Encarta anywhere? 2004, maybe in the last year they published it. So what came along in 2004 and knocked this puppy out of the market? You got it. Okay, now here's the question. What is fundamentally different about this as compared with Encarta and the Encyclopedia Britannica. What's the big difference? And it's huge. Huh? Collaboration is one that's good. Yes, you can collaborate. But what is it about collaboration? Like, who used to write the Encyclopedia Britannica and who wrote Encarta? Do you know? I don't know. Knowledgeable people that were hired, that usually had PhDs in that particular subject area, were hired to write those articles. A very inefficient way to do it because it takes a lot of time, a lot of research. If you have a PhD, it takes a lot more time. <laughs> <laughs> now, nah, some of my best friends, you know, no, anyway. So, um, but the reality is they changed the way in which they could basically create the information and knowledge. And it was revolutionary, okay? And then all the people who were the PhDs writing this thing, wait a minute, you know, they're not experts. This could be bad information, you know. You know, nay, 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 nay. And uh, hey, right now, everything else is gone. This is it. You know, you create an open forum. If somebody does something bad, you know, you go back and discuss it, take it down, do whatever. Is this an efficient way to do it? What does this cost? It's free. It's free, right? So it's hard to compete in a market like that. So see how we're leveraging technology here, what we're doing by changing the game and doing all these kinds of things. So think about leverage in your organization. Where does knowledge reside, right? You know, I mean, it's not that we're not going to need instructional designers. It's not that we're not going to need content experts, you know. But it is that there's a huge base of knowledge out there that we could tap into in an organization. And if we had the right tools, we could share that information around. We could evaluate it to see if it's you know, valid information. We can use technology to do a lot of good in the organization. And that's one of them. Now I'm going to do another evolution. Now this evolution is different in the sense that it didn't knock out the previous technology. Okay? So the evolution of Mayo. 
This is a first class stamp, right? Remember the forever stamp?